St. John Marie Vianney, the Holy Curry of ours, says the following, There are many Christians who do not even know why they are in the world. This is why yesterday I was encouraging you and I continue to encourage you to think and consider why am I here? Why has God placed me on this earth? Why has God given me life today, this very day? The Curry of Ours continues. The person, assuming they don't know why they're in the world, asks God, My God, why hast thou sent me into the world? To save your soul. And why dost thou wish me to be saved? Because I love you. The good God has created us and sent us into the world because he loves us. He wishes to save us because he loves us. To be saved, we must know, love, and serve God. Oh, what a beautiful life. How good, how great a thing it is to know, to love, and serve God. We have nothing else to do in this world. All that we do besides is lost time. We must act only for God. We should say on awaking, I desire to do everything today for thee, O oh my God. I will submit to all that thou shalt send me as coming from thee. I offer myself as a sacrifice to thee. But, O oh God, I can do nothing without thee. Do thou help me. The Curry of Ours continues. Oh, how bitterly shall we regret at the hour of death the time we have given to pleasures, to useless conversations, to repose, instead of having employed it in mortification, in prayer, in good works, in weeping over our poor sins. Then we shall see that we have done nothing for heaven. Oh, my children, how sad it is Three quarters of those who are Christians labor for nothing but to satisfy this body. And if the Kuri of ours were alive today, I'm sure the percentage would be higher. I'm sure he wouldn't say three quarters. It's way higher than three quarters. But again, quoting him, three quarters of those who are Christians labor for nothing but to satisfy this body, which will soon be buried and corrupted. That's actually the main reason why during Lent we have the skull here to remind us that our mortal bodies are going to soon be buried and corrupted. So again, the Curie of Ars says the majority of Christians, they labor, they labor for nothing but to satisfy this body which will soon be buried and corrupted while they do not give a thought to their poor soul, which must be happy or miserable for all eternity. They have neither sense nor reason. It makes one tremble. So the Holy Curie of Ars is saying it makes one tremble to think how the vast majority of Christians, they think and they live only for this body and they don't think about the well-being of of their soul. See, my children, we must reflect that we have a soul to save and an eternity that awaits us. Remember these words of the Holy Courier of ours because we need to reflect on this. He tells us, my children, we must reflect that we have a soul to save and an eternity that awaits us. 
Think about this for just a few moments. This is what we have to be thinking about. Our mind and our heart has to be here and really, this doesn't have anything to do with all the things that are going on in the world. I mean, indirectly it does. I mean, you've got to do things in the world well to save your soul. But see the difference between what, where our heart and our mind is supposed to be and what the world is doing. We must reflect that we have a soul to save and that an eternity awaits us. What is the world doing? The world just worries about the body and about prolonging a comfortable life here on this earth. I'm not going to say anything really about it tonight. Maybe, maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Maybe not. I don't know. It depends. But it, it, again, this whole um, supposed pandemic, it's really a scamdemic, but this whole supposed pandemic with the COVID and now with the vaccines and everything that's going on, we really should take time to reflect as best as we can on many different aspects of what is going on. But one of the things that is crystal clear is how far away the vast majority of us are truly from God. Because our mind and our heart is supposed to be on the fact that I have a soul to save and eternity awaits me. It's almost the complete opposite with everything that's going on with this, you know, coronavirus. Everybody's worried about the body and about life on this earth. What matters is eternity. It really doesn't matter if you die today or tomorrow or in one year or in 10 years or in 15 years or in 20 years. Certainly it doesn't matter in the ultimate scheme of things when you're talking about eternity. And that's why we must reflect that we have a soul to save and that an eternity awaits us. Kuryavar says what the church always teaches us the world, its riches, pleasures, and honors will pass away. Let us take care then. The saints did not all begin well, but they all ended well. Remember these words of the Courier of ours, you know, um, very, very wise words to encourage us. And the point is, is that the key is the end to prepare ourselves to be prepared for the eternity that awaits us because that's going to be determined at the moment of our death. We have to end well. And that's why the Courier of Ars says, the saints did not all begin well, but they all ended well. Every single one of them, without exception, ended well and ended very well. That's why they're saints. The Courier of Ars then, we have begun badly. Let us end well, and we shall go one day and meet them in heaven. And that should be the goal of every single one of us that's here tonight, to not worry excessively about the past, because we cannot change the past. Many of us have begun badly, like the Cory of Ars says. But we have to make every effort to end well. And again, God is so good because every single one of us that is here, God has given us life this day. We don't know about tomorrow, but he's given us life today. He's giving us an opportunity so that we can work hard and harder than we have in the past to save our soul because that's the only thing that is really necessary. Let us now listen to the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, this is Matthew 16, verse 26, quote, For what doth it profit a man 
if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul. Close quote. These are precious words of our Lord and Savior and make every effort to listen to them often and to believe them. What doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? If you reflect on these words of our Savior Jesus Christ and you do your best to open your heart to his grace, it's very likely that he will work wonders in your soul. This was one of the favorite sayings of St. Ignatius of Loyola, one of the great saints of the Catholic Church. And it's very interesting, the story of, we might say, the conversion of St. Francis Xavier, one of, also one of the greatest saints of the Catholic Church, and quite possibly after St. Paul, the greatest missionary that the Catholic Church has ever had. St. Francis Xavier pretty much single-handedly converted to the, the true Catholic faith um, uh, um, significant portions of, of India and of all the you know, different uh, islands in the southeast, in present Southeast Asia, Japan. He was about to try to begin evangelizing in China when he died. St. Ignatius was instrumental in the conversion of St. Francis Xavier. And what happened was that St. Ignatius, well, he goes through his own conversion, and then he's a little bit older, and so he's going now to uh, finish studies at the University of Paris, and that's where he meets St. Francis Xavier in the year 1528. So Francis Xavier was about 22, Ignatius was about 36. And basically, Francis Xavier and another um, individual named Peter Faber. Peter Faber was a Frenchman. Francis Xavier was a Spaniard. St. Ignatius of Loyola was a Spaniard. So Peter Faber and Francis Xavier were basically Ignatius' first two disciples. And he's trying to convert them there at the University of Paris. And it's not that easy because Francis has all these ideas of glory, just like St. Ignatius did too, of worldly glory. And so St. Ignatius, he quotes to him Matthew chapter 16, 26. And he tells him, For what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? And St. Francis Xavier hears him, but, you know, continues with his worldly um, uh, dreams, his dreams of worldly glory. And it's interesting because at that time, what Francis Xavier was also doing was he was certainly what most people would call a faithful Catholic, but again, still very strongly attached to the false promises and false attractions of the world. And here, definitely again, remember the gospel that we heard on Sexagesima Sunday. I hope I'm not making a mistake here because I don't have it written, but on Sexagesima Sunday, which is the sower sowing uh, seed in the field. Because, again, this is a beautiful gospel passage that we have to go back and also make every effort to reflect on so that we're more and more aware of the 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 the, the pressure and I would say the, the force and the influence of the devil, the world, and the flesh. The enemies of our soul's salvation. It isn't easy for the seed, God's word and God's grace to fall on good soil because everywhere there is rocky ground, there are the thorns that are going to choke the little plant, and definitely the devil is always around. Mm -hmm. 
even though St. Ignatius, even, at, I mean, at that time already, a, a very saintly man, and working to bring about this conversion of St. Francis Xavier, and those blessed words of our Lord having no effect. But St. Ignatius persevered. And he continued trying to encourage St. Francis Xavier. And I forget all the details, but he even helped him in some worldly ways. I think one time Francis Xavier, you know, was, uh, needed some extra money or something, and there St. Fran- and St. Ignatius was helping him along. But it did, the beautiful thing about this story is that it didn't take that long until St. Ignatius Loyola, inspired, I'm sure, by the Holy Ghost, on, let's, on a second occasion, once again reminded St. Francis Xavier of the same words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? And that second time, it really began to take effect in the soul of St. Francis Xavier. Obviously, the work of the Holy Ghost, but also, I think, almost certainly, because he also really began to consider, reflect, and meditate on the truth of it more and more. And so the one thing that is necessary is to work hard to save our souls. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, what we have to do is, first and foremost, we have to pray for the graces that are necessary to save our souls. Because we're never going to be able to do it alone. We need God's help. We need God's grace. That's why, as I mentioned also yesterday, that's why God has given us especially the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and for example, all the saints. That's why he's given us the church. That's why he gives us the sacraments. That's why he gives us all the different sacramentals, especially, we mentioned yesterday, the miraculous medal, but the rosary, the scapular, St. Benedict medal. But we have to pray for the graces necessary for salvation. And that's why... If there's one thing that I hope you take with you from this mission, it's take this prayer of St. Alphonsus Liguori, the prayer of praying for all the graces necessary for salvation. Pray the prayer as often as you can and pray it with a lively faith. I'll say a little bit about a lively faith in a few moments. Pray it with a lively faith. And do the best that you can to grow in your appreciation and love for these graces when God gives you the opportunity in your daily life. And, and, and rest assured, he's going to give you the opportunity to grow in your love for these graces if you're praying for them sincerely and with perseverance. Right now, I'm just going to go quickly. I'm not going to, hopefully I won't make any comments so that I can just get through the list. So that at least at the end of the mission, I can say we got through the list. Everybody at least heard succinctly what are these graces that are necessary for our salvation. This is what we should most hope for, what we should most pray for. Where our hearts and our desires, they should be on these things, on these graces. This is what we have to strive for. If we do this well, we will save our souls. And again, notice, in none of these petitions, so much of what's going on you know, in our lives, and definitely, not just so much, pretty much of everything that's going on in the world, none of this is asked for in this prayer. In this prayer, we're not asking for honors, we're not asking for riches, we're not asking for earthly pleasures and earthly comforts, we're not even asking for a long life. 
We're not even asking notice. I mean, pay attention. We're not even asking specifically for good health. And again, a real quick comment, a real quick commentary. Not that long ago I was reading, I forget where it was, but it, it's going on everywhere. You know, some, it, I, don't, I don't even know if it was a diocese or a parish, but they were trying to, and this wasn't that long ago, they were trying to justify why, I don't know, why they still had masses canceled or why they were still doing all kinds of things with the coronavirus. And the, the main justification was, well, it's because the most important thing is people's health. That's not the, that's not the most important thing. And this is, I mean, again, this being said by uh, Catholic authorities, members of the Catholic hierarchy, as if, like, we all know this and, like, this is the most important thing, people's health. That's not the most important thing. It's like, when did you lose the Catholic faith? The most important thing is the salvation of souls. Again, remember what I mentioned to you yesterday about our Savior Jesus Christ. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. It doesn't say for us men and for our physical health. Again, this isn't my opinion. This is, what the, this is the teaching of the Holy Catholic Church. A lot of people know that at the very end of canon law, it says, the supreme law of the church, you know, because the book of canon law has all the, let's say, all the laws of the church. You know, we might say, in a sense, kind of the worldly laws. And at the very end, the supreme law of the church is the salvation of souls. Not only is that the supreme law of the church, that's the supreme mission of the church. That, that's what the church has to be doing above all things. And now, and now we have people saying that because the most important thing is people's health. No, the most important thing is not people's health. And I'm not saying that our health isn't important. And I want to have good health too. But the most important thing is the health of the soul. And this is precisely what is being prayed for in this prayer. And that's why, again, we should know that it's very conspicuous. It should be conspicuous to all, all the worldlings that there's no petition for health, physical health. No petition. We're praying for the most important things. Not a mention about it. And yet you look and everybody around you today in the church, oh, the most important thing is people's health. It's sad, and, and, but I'm gonna, we're going to get to even something sadder. I mean, again, the situation that we're living in right now is extremely sad. There's an extreme crisis in the Catholic Church today, and it's because we've been overrun by the enemies of the salvation of our souls. We've been overrun by the devil, the world, and the flesh. Overrun. Here, then, are the petitions. A lively faith in all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. Light to know the vanity of the goods of this world and the immensity of the infinite good that God is. Grace to see the deformity of the sins I have committed, that I may detest them as I should. To know the love that God has borne me so that I will be grateful for so much goodness. A firm confidence of receiving God's merciful pardon for my sins. Holy perseverance, the glory of heaven. A great love of God, which shall detach me from the love of this world and of myself. To love only God, and thus do and desire only what is for his glory. Perfect resignation to God's will. Accepting with tranquility. Sorrows, infirmities, contempt, persecutions, aridity of spirit, loss of, pop, loss of property, 
of esteem, of relatives, and every other cross. We pray to offer myself entirely to God that he may do with me and all that belongs to me as he pleases. Light and strength to do his holy will. A great sorrow for my sins to grieve over them as long as I live. Weeping for the insults I have offered my God who has loved me so much and is worthy of infinite love. True humility and meekness, accepting with peace and even with joy all the contempt, ingratitude, and ill treatment that I may receive. Perfect charity, which includes desiring good for those who have harmed me and praying for them. Love for the virtue of holy mortification in order to chastise my rebellious senses and die to my self-love. Holy purity of body. Again, not health of body, holy purity of body. The grace to resist all bad temptations by having recourse to Jesus and Mary. Obedience to my spiritual father and all my superiors in all things. A pure intention so that in all I desire and do, I may seek only God's glory and to please Him alone. Great confidence in the passion of Jesus Christ and in the intercession of Mary Immaculate. A great love towards the most blessed sacrament. A tender devotion and love to the Blessed Virgin Mary. For holy perseverance and the grace to always pray for it, especially in time of temptation and at the hour of death. And then, for the holy souls in purgatory, for my family and benefactors, for those who hate me or who have in any way offended me, for all, for all infidels, heretics, and poor sinners, for light and strength, so that they can save their souls. For all to know and love God, especially me, for entrance into heaven, and for Mary to pray to Jesus for me. There you have it. Beautiful graces that we're praying for, and the most important ones. Why do you think we specifically in this prayer are praying for infidels, heretics, and poor sinners. Somebody who, someone who is very righteous and thinks he's a holy roller might say, that's the scum of the earth. Why why are we worrying about them? Because what matters is the salvation of souls. And those are the ones that, in the moment, if they're infidels, heretics, or poor sinners... They're the ones who are running the greatest risk of losing their souls. We pray for them because we're praying for the salvation of souls. The more that you reflect on all these different petitions, and hopefully that's what you will do, not just, not just during these days of the Lenten mission, but really, I'd say, for the remainder of your time on this earth. Reflect on these petitions. Because they don't have anything to do with all the stuff that's going on in the world. Everything that the world puts value on. It's, it's, it's basically the complete opposite. And yet, these petitions have everything to do with the salvation of the soul and the salvation of souls. It's also very significant that in this prayer, we pray multiple times for certain graces, especially the grace to love God, to love him above all things and to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, to be able to offer ourselves entirely to God. And then contrition for sin, sorrow for sin, weeping over our sins. 
and perseverance. It's very significant that these are graces that we're praying for for multiple times because these are key in saving our souls. To love God, to hate sin, and to persevere in God's grace. Tomorrow and Thursday, I'll comment more on the different petitions. But today, or this evening, I want to say just a little bit about the first one. Because not that the others aren't critical, but the first one's critical. That's why it's the first one. The first grace that we're praying for is a lively faith in all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. One can understand better the the grave crisis and the grave suffering that the Catholic Church is enduring in our times just on this one single point. Because primary importance is not being given anymore to what the Holy Catholic Church teaches. Instead of faithfully transmitting the truth that comes to us from Christ and the Apostles, This is the mission of the church. This is the mission of the pope. This is the mission of the bishops. To transmit faithfully what we call the deposit of faith. The true faith in God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. Instead of doing this, especially in the past 50 years, to a large extent, I mean, most in the Catholic Church and most in the hierarchy have been doing something very different. They've been worried about adapting to the modern world. They've been worried about pleasing the modern world. They've been worried about, oh, how do we have to update our Catholic faith? How do we have to change things in our Catholic faith? Make them better, update them. And and they say all kinds of sweet-sounding things to the faithful. That for sure, and, 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 and the sweetest talker of all is the devil. And he's also full of lies. And there have been so many lies that have been spread about our Catholic faith coming from the hierarchy in the last 50 years. We have to have a lively faith in all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. It's not a question of trying to update things. It's to put faith in everything that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. And the key word is lively. Listen to how St. Alphonsus Liguori explains a lively faith. This is key. When you're making this petition, pray with your heart that God give you a faith that is really alive. Not, Not just something that you're saying you believe and you kind of believe it, Because lively faith, basically, put very simply, it means that you really believe it to the point where you're living your life in accordance with that. You're living in accordance with what you profess to believe. Listen to what St. Alphonsus Liguori says. Many Christians believe without doubt that there is a just God who will judge them. Let me quickly just pause there. I mean, maybe that was true in his day, but that for sure is not true in our day. He says, many Christians believe without doubt that there is a just God who will judge them. I think there are very few Catholics who really believe that there is a just God who's going to judge them. All they've been told is God is merciful. And they don't really know anything about a judgment. It's just, well, you know, when I die, God is merciful. I go to heaven. God forgives And again, the reason why I say there's no way that many Christians really believe that is because we'd be living lives completely different 
if we really believe this. Anyway, St. Alphonsus Liguori still is getting there because he's going to make a point. He's going to say, you can't just say that you believe it. You've got to really live it. Many Christians believe without doubt that there is a just God who will judge them, that endless happiness or eternal misery awaits them. And yet they live as though there were no God, no judgment, no heaven, and no hell. There are many who believe that our divine Redeemer was born in the stable at Bethlehem, lived for 30 years in the humble abode of, at Nazareth, supported himself by the labor of his hands, and at last consumed his suffering and sorrow, ended his life on, the, on an infamous gibbet. And yet, they do not love him. Indeed, they offend him by innumerable sins. That's not a lively faith. If you really believe in all those things that St. Alphonsus de Gori just mentioned, that our divine redeemer was born in the stable at Bethlehem, everything that he suffered in his infancy, that he supported himself by the labor of his hands and consumed with suffering and sorrow, ended his life on the cross, how can you not love him? How can you not love him above everything? anything and everything that, that exists in this world? How can you not be willing to suffer a little bit for him? How can you not be willing to suffer a little bit for the holy sacrifice of the Mass? It is his sacrifice, truly, that is made present. And again, I specifically say that. How can you not be willing to suffer a little bit for the holy sacrifice of the Mass? Because this past year, in this regard, for the Catholic Church as a whole, it's been a disaster. It's been a disaster. And that's an understatement. If our faith is not a lively faith, if it doesn't affect our lives, the decisions that we're going to make and how we're going to live, how we're going to live our marriages, for example, how we're going to live the priesthood, for example. I mean, what does it mean to say, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe that he was born in a stable and that he suffered and died on the cross for me? And so St. Saint, Saint Alphonse is saying, okay, sure, there are, all these, there are all these Christians that say they believe all this about Jesus, and yet they do not love him. Indeed, they offend him by innumerable sins. It is to these that St. Bernard addresses his words of warning. Show by your deeds that you believe. By a virtuous life, a Christian must prove that he has faith. All right. Once again, I'm looking at my time and um, it's passing quickly. And I want to get to our Lady of La Salette, and a relevant example that just took place as recently as yesterday. Um, but let me just say a couple of very quick things about this first petition. In order to save our souls, we have to have a lively faith in all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. This is of utmost importance. Don't be fooled. No one is going to save their soul if they don't believe the truth and if they don't believe the truths of the Holy Catholic Church. This is why the Catholic Church is essential for salvation. And this is why we must, for the love of God and for the love of our faith, we have to make every effort that we can right now in the year of our Lord 2021 to recover the Catholic faith as best as we can. Because right now, in general, within the mainstream structures of the Catholic Church, it's gone. The Catholic faith is gone. And if you don't believe it, I feel sorry for you. I mean, right now, I don't have time to go into all the examples. We'll, we'll see a few. But here's what we profess in the Athanasian Creed. This is one of the four great creeds of the Catholic Church. Nobody can question this. I mean, if you question this, again, you're not Catholic. You don't have the truth. 
And the very beginning of the Athanasian Creed is the following. A lot of you are already familiar with this. I, 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 I preach about this often. It's so important. And we have to believe this. The very beginning, whosoever wishes to be saved, it, it begins beautifully. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of our creeds. And it's highlighting the importance of the salvation of our souls. And now that I'm talking about the importance of the salvation of our souls, I'm going to give all of you a little bit of homework. Think about the Holy... I'm going to ask you tomorrow or Thursday. Think about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. There is a key moment, and this is a big clue. There is a key moment in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And another really big clue is this has been eliminated in the new Mass. This is gone in the new Mass which is, again, is a tragedy of epic proportions, if only people realized it. But there's a key moment in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass where there's a great petition for the salvation of our souls, which is the most important thing. I mean, I would, I mean not going right now into details or trying to think, well, where, where's that moment? Because there are multiple moments, but there's a key moment. You would say, well, that's obvious. It should be obvious. If that's the most important thing, how can there not be a great petition for that in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? But uh, step aside from that right now and back to the Athanasian Creed. So, whosoever wishes to be saved must, before all else, adhere to the Catholic faith. He must preserve this faith whole and untarnished. Otherwise, he shall most certainly perish forever. We would do well to meditate on these words over and over and over and over again so that we're not misguided by so much garbage that's being said um, uh, left and right in the Catholic Church today. And then I'll give you one quote from Vatican Council I. This is the dogma, dogma of the Catholic Church. It's from the dogmatic constitution on the Church of Christ, Pastor Eternus, dated July 18, 1870. Couldn't be clearer. If the, if the Athanasian Creed isn't clear enough for you, listen to Vatican Council I. They're, they're quoting another ecumenical council, Constantinople IV. So, from Vatican I, the fathers of the Fourth Council of Constantinople, following in the footsteps of their predecessors, gave forth this solemn profession. The first condition of salvation is to keep the rule of the true faith. First condition of salvation. I'm not saying good works. Obviously, you need to do good works. But the first condition of salvation, you have to keep the rule of the true faith. You have to believe in the truth that Jesus Christ has taught. You have to believe, you have to have a lively faith in all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. What the Holy Catholic Church teaches, Jesus Christ teaches. It's not something separate. And then the next quote, I'm not going to read this quote anymore because i got to get moving here. I'll come back to it tomorrow. Then I had one other quote from Vatican Council I where it explains then very clearly that this is what the Pope is supposed to be doing. And it's very sad because especially since the Second Vatican Council, pretty much the Popes have been doing anything but this. All right. Let me skip quickly now to just... Our Lady of La Salette. I'm not going to finish everything on Our Lady of La Salette, so I will try to finish this up tomorrow. I'll, I'll go a little bit more on, on La Salette and a little bit less on Lourdes. So, on September the 19th, 1846, the Most Holy Mother of God appeared on the mountain of La Salette in the French Alps to two shepherd children. Melanie Calvert, age 14, and Maximin Giraud, age, tw age 11. Our Lady of La Salette wept. Our Blessed Mother, weeping. 
This is, this is perhaps the most outstanding aspect of this apparition of our Blessed Mother. Some of you are familiar with the statue of Our Lady of La Salette, where she's basically sitting down and she's got kind of has, has her head down in her hands and is just weeping. Our Lady of La Salette wept. She wept for the sins of man against God. And this is in 1846. In many ways, I would say this is truly a picture of our blessed and most holy and most loving mother during our times. Certainly in our times, in the year 2021. And notice that in the prayer where we're praying for the graces necessary for salvation, one of those graces is to weep, to weep for our sins. What stands out most about Our Lady of La Salette are her tears and the chain with a crucifix which hung from her neck. So these two things, remember them. I'll, I'll come back tomorrow to the crucifix. But the two things that really stand out about Our Lady of La Salette, her tears and the crucifix that's hanging, around, uh, hanging from her neck. Now, listen to what Our Lady of La Salette said. She said the following. Now, she's saying this for 1846, but also for the, the time to come. Boy, you better believe these things are being fulfilled in our day right now, even in 2021. Listen carefully. These are the words of Our Lady of La Salette, approved by the Catholic Church. This is, these are not my ideas, not my words from, from the Mother of God and approved by the Holy Catholic Church. Quoting Our Lady of La Salette. The priests... Ministers of my son, the priests, by their wicked lives, by their irreverence and their impiety in the celebration of the holy mysteries, by their love of money, their love of honors and pleasures, have become cesspools of impurity. Woe to the priests and to those dedicated to God, who by their unfaithfulness and their wicked lives are crucifying my son again. The sins of those dedicated to God cry out towards heaven and call for vengeance. And now vengeance is at their door. For there is no one left to beg mercy and forgiveness for the people. There is no one left worthy of offering a stainless sacrifice to the eternal for the sake of the world. Very significant what our Blessed Mother is saying there. I'll comment on that tomorrow. Very significant. Sometimes people today, they're, 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 they're more worried about asking, well, Father, but are you saying that the new Mass is invalid? And I'm not saying that. But people that are worried here about validity of Mass... Our Blessed Mother, is not, she's not talking about the validity of Mass. She's saying that there's no one left because, because of what the, how the priests are living. And believe me, it's worse right now than in 1846, way worse. She's saying that there's no one left worthy of offering the holy sacrifice for the sake of the world, for the sake of the world's salvation. Okay, she continues, still quoting from Our Lady of La Salette. The chiefs, the, leader of the, the leaders of the people of God have neglected prayer and penance, and the devil has bedimmed their intelligence. They have become wandering stars, which the old devil will drag along with his tail to make them perish. A great number of priests and members of religious orders will break away from the true religion. Among these people, there will even be bishops. And so people told me, yeah, but all the bishops are doing this. Yeah, well, sure, um, thank you. A lot of the bishops are lost, completely lost. Um, and then the final quotes here from Our Lady of La Salette. The vicar of my son, that's the Pope. The vicar of my son will suffer a great deal because for a while the church will yield to a time of darkness. The church will yield to a time of darkness. I'm not sure exactly what period of time our Blessed Mother is referring to, but one thing I know for sure is that it is a time of darkness right now for the church in the year of our Lord, 2021. So she says, the church will yield to a time of darkness. The church will witness a frightful crisis 
the true faith having been forgotten. All the civil governments, those of you that corona this, corona that, vaccines this, vaccines that, pay attention, bless the let. All the civil governments will have one and the same plan, which will be to abolish and do away with every religious principle to make way for materialism, atheism, and vice of all kinds. She doesn't say it specifically, but you should see everything that's being done right now today in 2021 by all the civil governments in the world to push forth unnatural vices. Unnatural, talking about the sin of Sodom. And then her final words at La Salette, in the year 1863, there will be desecration of holy places. In convents, the flowers of the church will decompose and the devil will make himself like the king of all hearts. Disorder and the love of carnal pleasures will be spread all over the earth. Finally, quoting Our Lady of La Salette, Rome, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. I'm almost finished. I'm just going to give you an example from yesterday. Those of you that think, oh yes, well, Our Lady of La Salette, that's nice and fine. Hopefully you won't think of that because it, it, it's not nice and fine. It's bad news. Now, we, not to despair, but we have to realize what we're up against. We're up against enemies of our salvation, the devil, the world, and the flesh that are very strong. And so we have to make every possible effort to counter that by, for example, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, doing our very best to be faithful to the prayer of the rosary, all those, you know, praying for those graces necessary for salvation, praying for a great love for our Lord and our Blessed Mother, a great love for the sacraments. That's not specifically there in the, in the prayer, but a lively faith in all that the Holy Catholic Church teaches. Some of the most important things that the Catholic Church teaches are the sacraments, the holiness of the sacraments, how sacred the sacraments are. And yet they're being desecrated left and right. Right now we're living in a time in the church where the sacrament of holy matrimony is being desecrated left and right. The sacrament of the priesthood, we just from Lady La Salette, desecrated left and right. I'm going to give you an example of this in just a moment. The sacrament of the priesthood, holy orders, desecrated left and right. Sacrament of confession, desecrated left and right. This example that you're going to hear, it, it covers both the priesthood and confession. Total desecration. Holy sacrifice of the mass being desecrated left and right. So here's the example, just so you'll see that Our Lady of La Salette is real today. I'm going to tell you a story, true story. This was just put on yesterday by a Catholic laywoman, traditional Catholic laywoman. And it's an interesting story that she's telling. Again, she's giving, she's giving her own witness of what occurred to her. So I don't think she's lying. If somebody doesn't want to believe her, well, you don't have to believe her. That's your business, not mine. But anyway, she's telling what something that she experienced. She doesn't give an exact date, but it's roughly, from really good sources, we know it's roughly about seven years ago. So most likely, I think this took place in 2014. So she's going to tell us what occurred um, in her experience, um, it's titled, My Encounter with the Demonic Inside St. Peter's Basilica. My Encounter with the Demonic Inside St. Peter's Basilica. And it's really interesting because she posted this just yesterday, so I would say whatever, I don't know, less than 48 hours ago. And the word I heard, again, from, from credible sources, was that in the interim, like let's say in the next, let's say 24 to 30 hours, so that she got a lot of responses from people that were confirming and saying, we experienced things very similar to what you experienced in St. Peter's. So it's, again, you know, so you say, well, you know, she's out of her mind. Well, there are probably a lot of other people that are also out of their minds. So this is her story. I, there's, again, there's a lot to comment on the story. I will comment a little bit also on her story tomorrow when I begin tomorrow, but I'm just going to read you the, her, her, her testimony. Not too long. Take me a couple minutes. And then we're done for today. We'll pick it up again tomorrow. This is her testimony. After lunch, it occurred to me 
that since I was so close to St. Peter's, I could pop in and go to confession, as there are always English-speaking priests on duty there. The confessors at St. Peter's returned from lunch at 4 p.m., and it was about 3.30 p.m., so I went and sat with our Lord in the Adoration Chapel inside St. Peter's to pray the rosary and pray my before confession prayers. At 1 p.m., I asked an attendant, I'm sorry, at 4 p.m., at 4 p.m., I asked an attendant which confessional had an English-speaking priest, and the attendant, attendant pointed to a box to my right. I entered the confessional, knelt down, made my confession, which contained nothing this priest hadn't heard thousands of times. When I finished my confession, there was silence. Nothing. I said, Father, that is my confession. Nothing. Father? I peered through the grate, trying to see if I could see anything. I could see the priest, and he was awake, sitting up straight, so he hadn't fallen asleep or been stricken. I said, Father, are you going to give me absolution? The priest then turned and put his face close to the grate and hissed, Why don't you go home and kill yourself? Obviously shocked and completely taken aback, I said something like, what? But then immediately realized that I needed to get out of there pronto. I leapt up and jogged away, stopping beside an empty confessional, beside the entrance barrier to the confessional area. A custodian of the basilica, a skilled layman professional called a San Pietrini, saw this happen and came over to me. He was Italian but spoke good English. He thought that I had gotten sick and perhaps vomited behind the confessional that I was standing next to. He asked if I was okay. I told him no. And then told him immediately that the priest in that confessional, as, as I pointed, had told me to go home and kill myself. Now here's where it gets really scary. The San Pietrini didn't even flinch when I said that. And then took a deep sighing breath and said, Yes, we get complaints. He clearly had heard of this happening before more than once. I told the San Pietrini that we needed to notify someone immediately and asked who we should tell. And he replied, completely resigned. No, there's nothing you can do. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Um, I'm almost done. I'm just, I'll just comment real quickly on this. Nobody cares about the, about the salvation of souls. They care about a lot of other things, like the environment. What about the salvation of souls? So, I, I, again, the response uh, back to her, there's nothing you can do, nobody cares. So I left and immediately got in a taxi and went to St. Mary Major, which always has English-speaking Dominican priests hearing confessions in the afternoon, and made my confession there and told the Dominican priest at Mary Major what had happened. And he, too, was not surprised. Let us conclude by praying. Holy Mary, Mother of Sorrows, whose heart was pierced with a fresh sword of grief at every station on the way of the cross, obtain for us, we beseech thee, O most loving Mother, a perpetual remembrance of our blessed Savior's cross and death, and a true and tender devotion to all the mysteries of his most holy passion. Obtain for us the grace to hate sin, even as he hated it in the agony of the garden, to endure wrong and insult with all patience, as he endured them in the judgment hall, to be meek and humble in all our trials, as he was before his judges, to love our enemies even as he loved his executioners and prayed for them upon the cross, and to glorify God and do good to our neighbors, even as he did, in every mystery of his sufferings. O Queen of Martyrs, by the dolors of thy Immaculate Heart on Calvary, who, who by the dolors of thy Immaculate Heart on Calvary didst merit to share the passion of our blessed Redeemer, 
obtain for us some portion of thy compassion, that for the love of Jesus crucified, we may be crucified to the world in this life, and in the life to come may, by his infinite merits and thy powerful intercession, reign with him in glory everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God willing, we'll see you tomorrow, tomorrow evening. May you have a blessed night.